What do we got here? What I've got is a 1861 Confederate coin that was from the shipwreck, the SS Republic. Oh, I do love coins. The SS Republic. Yeah, I, don't, I know all about these. Um, it's really cool, because he was actually a cabin boy on the show. Oh, was he? <laughs> What's up with all the old jokes, Rick? You're old. Not that old. Well, my Confederate half dollar and was part of the shipwreck that they found in 2003. I'm a coin collector and I've had it for a number of years. My interest is getting as much money as I can, but I like to have at least $800. Really interesting coin. These got a great history. Basically what happened was, is back in the day, there was a mint in New Orleans. The US government's minting coins down there and all of a sudden a war breaks out. The rebels take over the mint and proceeded to continue making coins. England didn't want to sell the South guns. They didn't want to take paper money. They didn't want to take bonds. They didn't want to take anything like that. They wanted hard money, gold or silver, because they thought the South might lose. So that's why they needed these coins. When the Civil War was finally over, the Union shipped all the coins made at the New Orleans Mint up to New York so they could be inventoried. And when the South needed money for reconstruction efforts, they sent the coins back down to New Orleans on the USS Republic. When the USS Republic was built, it was a revolutionary design. Yeah, this was literally one of the most high-tech ships in the world. It was just sort of a coincidence that these Confederate coins were going back down to New Orleans. They got caught up in a hurricane. The ship just got so beat up, there was no saving it, and it went down. But I believe they discovered it in 2003, started bringing the items up in 2005. When they brought them up, they all had damage, and this thing was in salt water for a long time and there's some corrosion on the coin. Well, and I agree with you, but to me, that's what gives it prominence is the fact that it has that salt water interaction effect, so you know for sure that well, it was buried at sea. How much do you want for it? Well, I've seen them go on the internet anywhere from 1,500 to 2,500. Okay. That's what they go for. Do you mind me asking what you paid for it? I paid uh, right at 600. So you gotta ask yourself, if someone sold it to you for 600 bucks, why didn't they sell it on the internet for 2,000? I've seen these go for like four or 500 bucks. Um, the problem was, is there was 57,000 of them, I believe, recovered. I can pay you 400 bucks for the coin. That's what it's worth. How about 425? No, 400 is my best offer. And the reason I'm going that high is they sell quick. Well, you really hurt me. You know, my wife spends more than that at the casino. <laughs> You've got a deal. All right, walk right over here and I'll write you up. I'm okay with only making $100 off this coin. All I have to do is put it out in the showcase, and my work is done. What we got here? This is an old Civil War pistol, a Clark and Sherrard. Uh, Clark and Sherrard. That is, yes, um, it might be the rarest Civil War gun there is. Uh, you just walked in here with Jimmy Hoffa. <laughs> <laughs> I got the revolver at an estate sale in Houston, Texas. I believe from what I have seen in my over 50 years of gun collecting, that it is an old Clark Sherrard cap and ball revolver. I'd be happy with $40,000. I know these folks have got to make a living, and I got a good price on it at the auction. You know how rare these are. There's like just a handful of these in the Absolutely. world. Absolutely. There's one at the Gettysburg Museum, but uh, it exploded during the battle. Well, the story was is that the state of Texas gave Clark and Sherrard thousands of dollars to start making their version of a cold dragoon. And they were having lots and lots of troubles with the guns. They didn't get delivered. And the whole operation more or less fell apart and folded. And then one of the partners went in, took some of the parts, put them back together, and sold off a few of the guns. And for every Clark and Sherrard real gun, there's like a 1,000 fakes. OK. And, um, Makes sense. I don't know if there's a bad fake where the casting came out terrible right here. Was there any paperwork or anything with this? No, sir. But the, you know, the fact that this one has no rifling leads me to believe that it was one of the ones that was put together from those parts, like you're talking about. If, if this thing is real, it's one of the coolest things that's ever walked in here. I'm like in awe of this thing right now, but just. They're so rare, I have my doubts. You understand why? It's just I can, I can you basically just walked in here with the Holy Grail. So how much you want for this thing? Uh, been several of them. Every one that sold for the, the big auction house. Uh, and it went for like 60, 70,000, something like that. And I, 
I'd be happy with 40000 You've literally walked in here and told me, you know when you go to France to the Louvre and you see the Mona Lisa? Well, that one's fake. I got the real one right here. I got here. the real one. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I'm going to go make a phone call, get someone down here. I'm not even beginning to figure out if this thing's real or fake. I just don't know enough about it. So let me call a friend who will know something about it, OK? OK. All right, I'll be right back. I've had a few gun shops look at it. Everybody thinks it's real. I think it's real. This thing is sort of like a time machine. It's, they don't exist. I'm hoping that the expert is going to finally be able to clear it up and authenticate the piece. Like I told you, the Mona Lisa, the one in France is fake. <laughs> <laughs> These are so rare. I mean, saying it's like the Mona Lisa is not an understatement. I've never seen one outside a museum, so I've never actually touched one. Can I touch it? Absolutely. <sighs> oh, wow. There's 11 known to exist. Four have this etching, this design. The last one came to market that was etched, and it was almost $80,000. OK. The serial numbers of the etched ones were in the hundreds and 200 range. This is in the range of the known etched guns, which is really good. The problem is, from the ones that I know that exist and the ones I've been able to research, the serial number font does not match this. It doesn't mean that the gun is fake. It does mean that the serial numbers are. Thanks, man. Yeah. Thank you very much, Thank sir. Thank you very much. You're very knowledgeable. It could be legitimate, but the serial numbers have been tampered with. And once that happens, you're not going to spend $80,000. Most collectors won't spend anything because they're too afraid to lose their investment. I love stuff like this. I love crazy, weird history. But we're 99% sure someone's tampered with that serial number. It, it's it's going to be too difficult for me to sell. I mean, when I, someone walks in my shop, I give a guarantee on every single thing I sell, and I can't do it on this. Good luck, dude. That's all I can tell you. <laughs> so what do we got here? Uh, got this sword I want to sell you. All right. And there's a mark on it that might be Tiffany's. Tiffany's, yeah. OK. It's not as good a shape as it was new. I guarantee you Tiffany never put anything this ugly out now. <laughs> <laughs> when I first saw the sword, I thought it was so cool. And I was quite surprised when somebody pointed me out the maker's mark on it. Fingers crossed that it'll bring in a, a lot of money and uh, that it is actually a Tiffany sword. All right. Uh, where'd you get it? I got it in Walla Walla, Washington, in a little antique shop. I'm a commercial photographer, so I used it as a prop and forgot about it for 10 years. OK. It looks like a cavalry sword we used during the Civil War. You can always tell by the handle and the shape. And it's got all the normal wear you would expect on it. You have no amateur restorations yeah. here, but I mean, it's got a good you know, patina to it. It looks nice. It's just the Tiffany thing is really, really throwing me off. I mean, I've seen hundreds, if not thousands, of Civil War era cavalry swords, and none of them said Tiffany on it. I didn't know they were a sword maker. Uh, yeah, I mean, they'll make pretty much anything, but if they did, they were generally presentation pieces, made of silver, very, very ornate, very beautiful swords that you would never want to take into battle. Uh, they're probably one of the most counterfeited jewelry companies in the world. Uh, that's because most of their stuff is so nice. Hell, even the Super Bowl trophy is made by Tiffany. It's not out of the question that a jewelry company would be asked to help aid in war efforts. So if this sword is made by Tiffany, it's got to be worth a pretty penny. I'm just not sure how many. What are you looking to get out of it, my man? A $500 check. That's what I'd like. Um, that doesn't seem out of the ballpark if it's made by Tiffany. I just don't know. I've never seen one like it. I'll tell you what, man. I got a uh, sword guy that works for me. Let me see what he uh, knows about this stuff, and I'll grab him for you, all right? All right. Why don't you uh, hang out and take a look around, and he should be here in a few minutes. OK, fantastic. No, it's a cavalry sword. It looks like Civil War era, but I've never seen Tiffany make one. Tiffany? Yeah. For the fancy army. Nothing but the best. This is a Model 1840 heavy cavalry sword, what's called the wrist breaker. Why is it called a wrist breaker? The predecessor swords would bend and flex, and the soldiers said they were good for cutting nothing but butter. 
<laughs> so when they designed the Model 1840, they put a lot of extra steel on the backside. It made the sword a lot heavier. And you're using that to just lop heads off or whatever you're doing. Whatever. Lop heads, slash, poke sometimes. But as you're hacking and slashing through with all your arms momentum and the horse's momentum, sometimes it snap your wrist, <laughs> giving it the nickname, you old wrist breaker. Sounds like a design flaw. Uh, it was loved and hated, but a lot of people don't realize that Tiffany did make swords for the Civil War. The presentation sword, which you would expect from Tiffany, that were all real pretty, and you really didn't want to wear them into battle. But they wanted officers to have really good functioning swords, too. So they outsourced the blades from a really high-end German company. It's a PDL right here. It's a Paul D. Lundschloss. Okay and they made functional swords for the officers. I can tell you right now, stamping Tiffany and Co. in something isn't that hard to do. So mm -hmm. question is, is it definitely Tiffany? Absolutely. Well, the Tiffany mark's almost gone on this side. Anything Tiffany is usually reproduced and faked out there. So when you go over a piece of Tiffany, you have to do a lot of detailed inspection to make sure that it is Tiffany and not a reproduction. You know, Tiffany's a little more sought after than your standard Absolutely. US swords. One of the things Tiffany did, instead of using a brass guard, they would use an iron guard. And yep, that's definitely iron and not brass. And then the PDL mark, they did have a die that was broken, and a lot of them do look like a lowercase r instead of a big P. So is it real, man? Yeah, it's real. Yes. All right, that's why I hired you. <laughs> if someone sells it in this shop, it's gonna be you. What do you think you can get out of it? <sighs> this one, you know, it does have some issues here with uh, the leather strap missing. It's actually coming off in my hands. <laughs> and that would make it a little bit more valuable, but... 1500 Excellent. Very good. All right, man. Well, get back to work. Yes, sir. <laughs> Thanks. The wrist breaker swords, something every Civil War collector wants. But to have one made by Tiffany, that's like the highlight of anyone's collection is to show off their Tiffany sword. All right, so you said you wanted 500 for it. Yep. But you brought the expert in. <laughs> yeah, that doesn't always work out that well for me, does it? Now, you've just educated me. Let's go eight. You know, man, I really don't have to have it. You know, it's... You don't have one. It's a Tiffany's. <sighs> you know, I am going to have to get it rewrapped. It's going to have to be cleaned up a little bit. We'll do 650. 675, you got a deal. All right, 675, man. Cool. You got it. Why don't you go ahead and find Rocco back there. He'll write you up. Great. Thank you. Uh, 675. Now I have some money to go spend uh, something for the girlfriend at Tiffany's. <laughs> well, I've got something for you here. Two Civil War diaries from my great great grandfather. Okay. He was in every major battle of the Civil War. He was at Gettysburg, he was at Chancellorville. He was at Sherman's March to Sea, Burning of Atlanta. Uh, Hiram Otis Warren is his name. He was a captain in the Union Army, 123rd New York Infantry. So were you ever in the military? Nope. Me neither. They wouldn't take me. <laughs> I came to the pawn shop today to sell my great-great-grandfather's diaries from the Civil War. I'm not really that sentimental of a person. I'd rather have the money at this point. I'm trying to get $20,000. The least amount I could take would be $3,000. Um, so these are from? 1864 and 1865. Have you ever read them? Uh, I've tried to. They're really hard to read because it's all in script. You really have to be used to reading writing from this time period because it's not really like we write today. He mentioned being in Marietta in 1865 when he mentions uh, Lincoln dying. I mean, this is the one thing you'd carry around because right. you really had to figure out ways to entertain yourself. Right. Night. You could read a book, you could write a little bit. Maybe there was a little campfire with someone playing a fiddle or something like that, but that was uh, about it. U.S. military now spends millions of dollars a year to entertain the troops. It's considered essential to keep up morale. Back during the Civil War, the soldiers basically had to entertain themselves. I bet a diary was a good distraction. This one's neat. It's got just a little teeny bit of an almanac on the front of it. We got the moon phases for November, December. We have rates of postage, a table of stamp duties. Back then, they had a stamp tax on a lot of different items. And to prove that the taxes was paid, you had to buy a stamp from the government. 
and affix it to whatever was taxed. I mean, this one's in great shape right here. I mean, considering how old it is. This one... Seen eh. better days. Civil War stuff is super collectible. People actually started souvenir collecting during the war itself. And there's been a high demand for Civil War collectibles ever since. If this diary is tied to someone important, it could be really valuable. What do you want to do with them? Um, I want to sell them because they've been handed down to the mail, um, you know, since this guy, and I'm the last one. I'm an only child, I don't have any kids, and I could probably use the money for some better things like get my car fixed. Do you mind if I have someone come down and take a look at these things? No, sure. I'd like to find out more about it myself, actually. Let me see if my one buddy knows about this captain. If they find something extraordinary about right. him. If there is, I can make an offer. But they are one of a kind. Well, yeah, if I wrote a diary, it'd be one of a kind. You wrote a diary, it'd be one of a kind. Doesn't necessarily mean it's worth money. OK? Uh, I'll be right back. Let me go make that phone call. OK. I've looked at the diaries a little bit to see what was in there, but I really don't know the historical significance, and I'm hoping to find that out today, too. Mark, how's it going? Doing all right. So what you got? I have two diaries from the Civil War. OK. What was your great-great-grandfather's name? Hiram Otis Warren. Um, I just want to know if there's anything special about him or maybe anything cool about the diaries. The guys normally call me down here when they have something unusual or, or some historical artifact that they just like a little bit more information on. Do you know what unit he was with? The 123rd New York Infantry. Well, that's an interesting unit. They were at Chancellorville. They were, they were at uh, Gettysburg. You know, they were at Appomattox. They didn't lose very many men over the course of their enlistment. Do you mind if I take a closer look at them? No. Ah. Help yourself. I always enjoy looking at Civil War items, especially when somebody has a diary from that period. I have to take a look at it to see whether there's anything spectacular in the diary. I have a rubber coat. <laughs> yeah, this is, it's, it's interesting because some of the comments in here are just sort of day-to-day -day life kinds of comments. When you think of the Civil War, we tend to think of the battles, yet most of the time that you spent was downtime. And so a lot of guys carried diaries. So is there anything that makes them extraordinary? No. You know, it's wonderful. It's a diary from that time period. So this captain is nobody special? I didn't find anything that, that he stood out, you know, he didn't save Grant's life or something like that. Thanks, Mark. I really appreciate it. Not a problem. Thank you. Even though they are from the Civil War, they're not necessarily that rare. There were a lot of these diaries kept by different men. How much were you looking to get out of them? You know, with their historical documents, I was thinking, $20,000. Oh, no, 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 no. For something to be worth like $20,000, we're talking the sidearms off a major general. Um, OK. I, I'm thinking I would probably get two or $300 a piece out of them. I'm thinking like 100 bucks a piece. Well, that's not nearly enough. Um, I mean, unless it is a major historical figure or something like that, the buyer right. is not going to be there for $20,000 ever. Like $3,000, that's what I would need to part with them. Uh, it's just not there. Right. I mean, I would literally go like 100 bucks a piece. Yeah, if it were just a couple hundred bucks, I mean, I'd rather give them to a museum. A than... lot of museums would really appreciate them, too. No, I think that's what I'll probably do then. OK, well, thanks for coming in, man. All right, thanks. The diaries are almost 150 years old. I thought his offer was really, really low. It wasn't for me. I got an atlas from the Civil War period I'd like for you to look at. And see you do? If wow. Go grab me my book pillow. Uh... This thing? Yes, that thing. What's it for? It's for looking at books. Well, I come down to the pawn shop today to try to sell my Civil War period atlas. Bought it from a guy that sets up at the flea market. I think it's worth a thousand. If I can't get a thousand out of it, I'll take it back home, put it up, and keep it. Do you know much about this? No, I know it's from. It's marked in the front, 1862. All right. And Nevada didn't become a state until 1864 on Halloween. Really? Sort of appropriate for Nevada. It'd be interesting to see what the map looks like of the state. Um, it's flat on the bottom. Well, remember, at this point in history, we were still a territory. We weren't a state. Las Vegas would be right around in here. And there we are, Vegas. It doesn't say Las Vegas, it says Vegas. The reason people would stop in Vegas on the trails going to California 
There was a stream here that ran year long, You'd come and water your horses, water up, and everything like that. It wasn't until 1905 when they built a railroad station that people started moving here. But the population really boomed in the 1930s with Hoover Dam and the legalization of gambling. So when this map was made, Vegas was pretty much a one-horse town. Is this just the United States, or is there? No, it's the world. OK. We have Prussia, Norway, Sweden. These were taken off engraved plates, the colorizing and everything like that. I imagine this was expensive back in the day. What it's worth today, I don't know. Atlases can be worth a lot of money. There was one from the 15th century that sold for over $4 million. And how much do you want for it? I'd like $1,000 for it. OK. I mean, the way I look at it, this could be $10,000. This could be nothing. That's a big difference. The cool thing is, though, we have these engravings. This is really high quality paper. I see a degree of quality you just don't normally see. Do you mind if I have someone take a look at it? Not at all. Be right back. Thanks. I'm looking forward to having somebody come in and check it out, because I actually do not have a clue what it's worth myself. Hey, how's it going? Hi, Rick. Nice to see you, chum. Hey. How are you Hi. doing? All right, let me take a look. See, I'm using the book cradle. I'm so proud of you. You're taking <laughs> care of books for me. All right, Johnson's new illustrated steel plate family atlas. Compiled, drawn, and engraved under the supervision of Colton. Colton was the huge name for atlases in the Civil War period. Something that's created by Colton can be worth thousands of dollars. We're talking even $15,000 or more. But the thing is, it can only be worth you know, a little bit or nothing at all. Okay. It depends on the details that we find within the atlas. This atlas was published during the Civil War. What I'm looking for is any sort of illustration that shows that the Civil War was happening, because that's what a collector is going to want. We've got the United States, all pink, and note that there's no division between the Confederate States and the Union. These publishers were based in New York, so they were definitely pro-Union, and they weren't interested in acknowledging the fact that the Confederate States existed. Uh, this is what I love. Look, Arizona with two R's. All right? So in the 1860s, this area right here was the New Mexico Territory, and that was part of the Union. There was a battle during the Civil War that happened all the way out here in the West called the First Battle of Mesilla and the Confederate forces won. And they took over this entire swath right here and renamed it the Confederate Territory of Arizona. OK. So we actually do have evidence of the war happening here. And the cool thing about this in particular is this Confederate Territory lasted less than a year. You're not going to see it in many atlases at all because it existed for nine months, maybe? Um, so we actually have weird Confederate Territory right here. Exactly. Another thing that I'm noticing as I look at this, these aren't engravings. One of the key things you always see with an engraved plate is a plate mark, a line that kind of borders everything. Because when you're creating an engraving, you have to press really, really hard to get the paper to soak up the ink, because the ink is actually in those divots that you've made, right? Yes. And here, there's no evidence of any plate marks. It is a beautiful, smooth lithograph. It says still engraved on the title page. You can't trust a title page. So that's going to affect the value pretty dramatically. OK. All right, so do you think it's worth anything? I placed the value for this book at around 2,500. Wow. It's no Colton, but we'll take it. Thanks, Rebecca. I really appreciate it. No problem. Jump. All right. See you Good next to time. See you. Right. Take care. When Rebecca started pointing out those short lived Confederate territories, I thought we were going to be close to that $15,000 mark. But this thing is still pretty cool, and I think there's something we could do with it. All right. So, um, what's your best price? I still like to get a thousand out of it. Deal. Thanks. Okay. Appreciate right it. Right about, chum. I'll meet you over here at the counter. All right. I was excited when she told me the price. I got a thousand bucks. I feel great, and I think I'm gonna go buy something else and add it to my collection. Hey, how you doing? Good. How are you? I have some Civil War Navy buttons that I want to sell. Cool. 
Did you tear apart a jacket or something? Or? <laughs> it's a good possibility, you know, somebody in the Civil War, they were actually fighting in a battle and had those buttons on their uniform. I never had any piece of American history before, so it was kind of neat coming across that. It's not something you find every day. I'm hoping to get $1,300 for them. I really don't have any use for them, um, and I could definitely use the money more than the buttons. <laughs> So you got any of the backstory on them, or? Um, I found them in a house that I purchased, and I found out that the previous owner's grandfather was enlisted in the Navy during the Civil War. OK, he was a uh, Union, right? Yes, he was. The Navy was kind of like the unsung heroes of the Civil War. The North just brought the ships down, blockaded all the ports. It crippled the South. I mean, they couldn't buy anything. I mean, they couldn't get bullets for their guns. Everything was rationed. I had no idea. During the Civil War, the South had to get a lot of their supplies from Europe because they didn't have anywhere near the manufacturing that the North had. So a major part of the North's strategy was to block Southern ports so they couldn't get their shipments. Kind of hard to fight a war without guns and ammo. It's got the Eagle. It's holding the anchor. Obviously, it's Navy. So what exactly are you looking for? I just want to make sure they don't say made in China or <laughs> something on them. But they're made by different people, so that kind of makes me wonder if they're all from the same period. Do you have any idea of what you might want to get out of them? I'm hoping $1,300. $1,300. Kind of in a predicament here. I know the Navy, they kept some of their uniforms for almost 100 years. Oh, wow. So you might have something really cool here that could be worth a bunch of money or nothing at all. Well, hopefully <laughs> it's worth a bunch of money. <laughs> I need to get somebody down here and kind of tell me exactly what these buttons are and how long they've been around. So who are you going to call in to look at these buttons? Uh, he's the administrator of the Clark County Museum system. Probably the smartest guy in the world. <laughs> All right, sounds good. All right, I'll be right back. OK, sounds good. Oh, interesting. So the Navy played a big role in the Civil War, right? Oh, yeah. If we hadn't had the Union Navy, we wouldn't have been able to blockade all the ports in the South. That made a huge difference. It intercepted a lot of the firearms that the South was trying to bring in. So it was an effective force. Most people, when they think of military in the Civil War, they think about the Army. They tend to forget the Navy, and yet the Union Navy had a huge part in helping to defeat the South by blockading the, the ports, by coming up the Mississippi River and attacking from the river. Is there any way to actually tell for sure their Civil War? I mean, they do look like they're made by different people. Yep, and that would make sense. From 1850 to 1941, we didn't change the design on these buttons. Every time they needed another batch of them, different button companies would bid on them. So what we have to look at in order to tell whether they're Civil War is who made them and how they marked them. Oh, that's nice. That's, that one was actually made in London. Now, that's a different one. Interesting. And some of these are not easy. Of what I'm seeing of the back stamps, given who did them, you know, Scoville and Horseman and Sons and some of these companies, these are all major manufacturers. I think these are Civil War buttons. Oh, wow. This is, they, they date right. They're either 1850s or early 1860s. They're not real common. And the nice thing about this group is that there are a number of different manufacturers. And button collectors tend to want a button from everybody who put out that button. So it's a nice find. It's right good to mark. know. All right. <laughs> Gave me everything I needed, buddy. It was interesting to see these buttons. You know these came off a uniform. Somebody wore these during the battles. They're a tangible tie to that time period. You told me earlier 1300. I'm sure there's probably like a grading system for these. Pristine ones like this one, I would say, is in really good shape. Mm -hmm. Compared to this one, not so much. That being said, I'll start off around 200 bucks. I've seen these types of buttons sell for thousands, and I've seen buttons sell for pennies. It's really a crapshoot depending on the buyer, so I gotta be cautious with my offer. How about a thousand? Some had different values online than other ones. I think I can probably make some decent money off them. It's just, it's gonna take me a long time to do it. I'll go up to 400, I'm not paying any more though. I'm really not. 
Six hundred and you have a deal. I'll pay you five. That's it. All right, you got a deal. Deal? All right, cool. You gonna pack these up and meet me over there? All right. I actually was expecting to be offered a lot less, so $500 is definitely a good payoff. It was worth a little bit of digging. How's it going? Yeah, what can I help you with? Uh, yeah, I got a uh, Civil War dog tag. OK, so it's an identification tag for a soldier. So the War of 1861, that's the Civil War. Generally, the wars get named afterwards. This just was just starting off, and it didn't have a name yet. <laughs> I collect and I sell Civil War memorabilia, and I came across the 1861 Civil War dog tag. I checked some recent prices of these, and I'm asking 1100 for the dog tag. This is pretty cool. Where'd you get this thing? Small antique show in uh, New Hampshire. Strangely, it's marked War of 1861. Okay. You know, the Civil War, soldiers, sometimes they would camp out for months on end in just one location. There was traveling salesmen all following these camps, selling everything from guns to pots and pans, and that's how they made their money during the war. And this is one of those things. Yeah. Originally, ID tags weren't issued by the government, but soldiers could purchase them on their own. It was a really early version of a dog tag. This could have been sold any time during the war. You know, probably during 1861, I would assume, just because yeah. I've seen some that said 1861, two and three, which was interesting. And um, the mystery of it, was it uncirculated, not issued, or did a soldier buy it and, you know, never got it stamped? Yeah, I'm, I'm assuming it wasn't stamped. It might have been surplus or something like that. There's no name on it or anything like that. Mm -hmm. How much do you want for it? I'm asking 1100 Do you mind if I have someone look at it? I just want to make sure it's real. Just about everything from the Civil War has been remanufactured, and literally they make a copy of everything. So that I want to get checked out. I also want to see if, it's, if there's anything special about it. I'm glad an expert is going to check out the item because I want to make sure it is real. Civil War dog tag, or whatever they called it back then. Do you mind if I take a closer oh, look? By all means. Oh, OK. Nice. The War of 1861, that's the Civil War. Of course, at that time, we didn't have any ID for the troops on either side. And if you died on the battlefield, your body might be found, and we might not know who you were. So something like this, even though it was privately issued, the idea was, well, maybe somebody would know who you were when your body was found. OK. You bought these from sutlers. The settlers were basically the private storekeepers. They would set up shop on the edge of wherever the troops were camped. If you wanted one of these, you could buy it from a settler. He would then stamp your name in it, and you could put it on your clothes. You could sew it into your clothes. You could wear it on a strap around your neck if you wanted to. The idea was to have it somewhere where it wouldn't get lost. OK. So. Rick, what are your concerns on it? OK, is it real? Because I know they reproduce everything for Civil oh, yeah, War they, reenactment. They do, yeah. But this one, this is a Civil War era piece. OK. Is it a, one of the common ones or one of the rare ones? This is one of the well-known designs. So yes, there are a number of these out there. Normally, they are named on the back, but not all of them. There were a number of these that weren't actually sold, and they just ended up being surplus. But this one, yes, this is a Civil War era piece. The ones that people really like are the ones that are named. OK. Thanks, man. Appreciate not it. No problem. Very good to meet you. Good to meet you. Thank you. OK, so you want 1100 bucks for it? Yeah. OK. I can't come near to that. If it has a name on it, you're getting close to that number. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't. Okay. OK. It's one of the common ones. I mean, I'd, I'd literally give you like 100 bucks for it. Wow. Yeah, I can't do that. But um, you know, I do appreciate you looking at it. All right. Well, thanks, man. Change your mind. Come on back. All right. Unfortunately, we weren't able to make a deal today. I thought 100 bucks was way too low. I mean, I look at a lot of stuff at a lot of antique shows, and I've never seen this item.